Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Leader Spotlight. We're gonna introduce you to some of the leaders for Convergence and talk some about their classes. Today, we've got Judy Zugish, we have Angela Schneider, Betty Kirk, Diane Totten, Janie Taylor, Robin Spady, and Susan Lazier. If you're not familiar with Convergence, it's a wonderful seven-day fiber art conference it's going to be July the 15th through the 21st in Knoxville, Tennessee. We are excited about all the different activities and programs that are going to be going on. We've got a lot of exhibits, the fashion show, keynote, tours, much, much more. And of course, the marketplace, a chance to buy some more yarn, get some equipment and test drive that loom that you always wanted to try. There are so many different kinds of sessions that you can participate in. We have over 120 seminars and workshops, everything 90 minute, three hour, or a one, two, three day workshop. Now, remember, you have to be a member in order to take a class. And if you buy the CVP, the Convergence Value Package, you will save 25% on your registration. Today, we've got Judy Zugish. She is gonna be teaching Stepping Stones. This is a three-day basketry class. It's on Tuesday through Thursday. Hey, Judy. Hey there. Am I there? You're there. I'm gonna <laughs> let you start. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, it's fun to be able to tell you a little bit more about this piece. It's a three-day workshop because it really reaches out to the basket maker who has some skills or um, somebody who's worked with natural materials because it really involves getting deep into the weeds with willow bark. And willow bark is something that I'm growing here in the nursery. And um, you can see behind me, this is where the studio workshop space is. And so I raise this willow bark and then it goes through a drying process and then I soak it and I start to prepare it and turn it into the elements that we're gonna work with. So for anybody who's already a basket maker and you haven't had your hands on willow bark, this is absolutely a fabulous introduction. So the piece itself, and we've got a few pictures to see, but let me just show you the finished piece right here in the studio. And it's named Stepping Stones because it really works systematically through the piece to make steps. So those of you, of course, are familiar with twill, but you'll see that it migrates in several different sections. And that really shows off the nature and character of the willow bark itself and how to shape and form it. Um, it's a really fun, uh, intense piece, but I love the idea that it's several days because you do a bit, you come back to it the next day, you've really absorbed what you had learned before and come into it. And then it finishes with a really fabulous border, uh, a folded rim border that is from the Northwest coast. That's super to be able to learn that and put it into your lexicon of what you already know. So Kathy, let's look at those pictures for just a minute. And it'll okay. begin to tell you, um, so here I am prepping in the studio. You can see a piece that's finished, but you can also see a piece in progress. And one of the things that happens with this bark is it goes through several different stages of color changes and things too. So when you're choosing to use the outer bark or the inner bark, you're already designing. So no two pieces will be the same which is cool. It's also a mold woven piece. So you can see the stack of molds as I was getting ready that I've put tape on that are a foam board. And that gives us a shaping possibility that's really helpful. Both mold woven and pre-shaped pieces um, behave a little bit differently as a basket maker. So uh, that's, that's looking at it as I was getting ready for the last time um, I prepared a class. Let's see the next one, Kathy. Yeah, so here's the beginning. Um, it's a twill base and fitting, and there's some really kind of special techniques when you're working with barks because they have a raised weight to them and pattern to work with. So this is really a, a great foundational piece to learn as well in natural materials, and it can go on to many different shapes and things, but in this case, that's, that's kind of where we wanna begin. 
And then you're looking here closely at where we started to transition into, so most of this is a twill weave with flat pieces, but now we're going into twining on a bias weave. And that's a very cool technique to learn. It has to do with your number of stakes, of course, but also how you execute with it. So it makes a really textured moving piece. It also controls the shape wonderfully when it comes off of the mold. Yeah. And then you can see here, now, if you look closely at that picture, you can see inside barks and outside of barks and how they mingle. And again, how you compose it so that it becomes that side. And the beauty of this particular piece is that it has enough length to it um, and continuity that you really will see that at all times. So I love seeing how different every piece uh, comes to be. And here's the finished piece again. And, um, I add some straps. Um, I got some lining the last time I was at uh, Convergence of that beautiful soft leather. So we often will use that too. And uh, you get into that folded rim border that I was talking about. So step by step, that's stepping stones. And I, I hope if it intrigues you to work with natural materials that you'll sign up and come. This is a student's piece of work. And um, you can see how fabulous they turn out and also how different they turn out in each person's hands. I just think it's amazing, Judy, that in three days, you'll walk away with that beautiful purse or bag, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's so detailed. It's just amazing. Oh, thank you. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a lot of it. It has to do with the fact that I prepare for three days before I come, which <laughs> <laughs> it gets Thank in you your for that. Hand. That's right. <laughs> well, if you are interested in making this gorgeous basket, it sounds like, can a beginner take your class? So I would say anybody who either has um, basket skills, not necessarily, or natural material skills. It, it is a fairly intense class. Okay. I definitely can teach it to a beginner, but it requires quite a got, bit of concentration. That's why it's a three-day class. But a beginner who feels confident, I'm, I'm happy to take you on. I'm just saying that if you haven't made baskets before and you start with this one, it's not the easiest place. A couple of other things I'm teaching are easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would encourage anyone who's considering this class and you're not quite sure, contact Judy and uh, you two can talk and make sure this class is good for you. But if you do have some basketry experience, Stepping Stones, it's a three day workshop, Tuesday through Thursday. Thank you, Judy. Oh, thank you. All right. Next up, we have Angela Schneider. This is Woolen Spinning. It's a three hour seminar and it's Saturday, July the 16th. Hey, Angela. Hi, Kathy. Take it away. Thanks for, for having us here again to talk about our workshops. So woolen spinning. When you learn to spin, you hear a lot about worsted versus woolen. And I think most folks start out on the worsted end where you get smooth yarns like this that are, the fibers are aligned, the yarn is dense, it's nice and hard wearing. Way over on the other end of the spectrum is woolen spinning, where the fibers are actually jumbled up in the yarn and you trap lots of air. And what you end up with is something that's really squishy and yarns that are really stretchy. And some of that stretch is coming from the wool that's used in this particular yarn, but a lot of that is coming from the way that this yarn was spun. And you end up with fabrics like this one is a woolen spun scarf, and it's just got huge amounts of squishiness to it. Again, some of that's coming from the wool and a lot of it's coming from the way the yarn was spun. So this is a skill builder workshop. We're gonna be looking at two different woolen type drafts. Uh, they're all considered long draw. You're gonna let the fiber twist in your drafting zone. So it's twisting before you're pulling it out to its final size. That goes against maybe what you might've been taught about keeping your yarn straight between your hands, uh, but it's, a uh, how you get lots of air trapped and your yarns end up getting softer and loftier and warmer. We're also going to look at using hand cards. So the supply list has a spinning wheel and a set of hand cards so we can learn to take washed wool, starts out like this, and make these beautiful, yummy, fluffy roll eggs that we turn into those woolen yarns. Um, to um, take the class, you need to be able to 
work your spinning wheel and spin a yarn and a join on. No judgment about how good you think your yarn is. You just have to be able to spin a continuous yarn. And then we'll work on getting your long draw technique and then work on getting your smoothness and your consistency with these two techniques. Um, it does require that you bring a single drive spinning wheel. Uh, the supply list specifies a scotch tension where you have your drive band on your flyer and your brake on your bobbin. It's also okay if you have an Irish tension type wheel where your drive band is on the bobbin and your brake is on the, on the flyer, as long as you have a drive band and a brake. We're not going to be working with double drive wheels in this particular book. Um, you also need to bring some hand cards. I'll have a couple of extra pairs, but not enough to go around. So if you've got a pair of hand cards or can borrow one, please bring those along and I'll supply all the fiber. So in addition to uh, just fluffy yarns, there's also a couple of specialty yarns that we can talk about, like lopy yarns. Is This has been fulled, so it's not stretchy. And some novelty yarns, like this is a garneted yarn that's got fluffy things in it. And the woolen spinning technique is great for trapping that sort of extra bits in the into the yarn that's and it's going to be lots of trying out a technique and lots of practice and lots of refinement with with somebody on hand that can watch what you're doing and adjust and and help you get the right feel for this particular spinning technique and you might it what's really fun about it is this this one of the techniques called double drafting that we're going to do it feels a lot like you're stretching a rubber band when you spin I'm going to try to adjust my camera view to see my spinning wheel. My extra camera was giving me fits earlier, so we're just going to go old school. See, I've got a nice fluffy roll lag. I'm making a slub. Oh no, we're not supposed to do that. Well, in woolen spinning, you are. You make a slub, and then we're going to draft out into a nice smooth yarn, and all that air that was in the roll lag is now trapped inside the yarn and it's a really fun way to spin and once i learned this technique it took me a little while to get a hold of it and i've discovered i'm a natural long draw spinner it just feels nice to do it so i hope a lot of folks will uh, come over to the woolen side of the spinning world and join us in this three-hour seminar on saturday I was laughing, Angela, because I've only spun i think i took one workshop so i am not a spinner but i was thinking I was learning something as you were describing the class. You're such a good teacher. I just, I really admire your skills in doing that. Um, one quick question, because people ask me all the time, and I have absolutely no idea. Can they use an e-spinner in this class? Thank you for asking that. Yes, an e-spinner is going to be perfectly fine in this class, as long okay. as it's one where you can adjust the, you've got a separate control on the flyer and a break on the bobbin so that you can adjust the take up. All right. Thank you, Angela, for sharing. Thing, just in case you're interested in cotton, this techniques, these techniques are also really good with cotton. Oh, that's good to know in the South, especially. All right. Thank Thanks, you, Angela. Kathy. Again, it's the Woolen Spinning. It's a three-hour seminar. If you have more questions, you can contact Angela. All the information is on our website. Thank you, Angela. Thanks. Next up, more spinning. Spinning short fibers. This is a one day workshop. It is Sunday, July the 17th. And this is with Betty Kirk. Hi, Betty. Hi. Um, I designed this class um, because people don't, they're afraid of spinning short fibers, especially cotton. And I decided that the main reason is, is they don't know how to adjust their spinning wheel. You need a spinning wheel um, that is not a bulk spinner and preferably scotch tension. And um, I had originally planned this for um, spinning um, with a spinning wheel, but also you can use um, an e-spinner. They work well. And um, to make it fair for everyone, I decided you know, we might as well let people with spindles come because it's really hard to travel with a spinning wheel. So I will cover how to spin on a regular spinning wheel, not a bulk spinner. Um, E-spinners work well if you can um, 
adjust the tension, as the previous speaker said, with uh, attention on the bobbin. And we're going to cover all sorts of short fibers. Uh, in the last few years, they've come up with easy to spin cotton. Cotton Clouds has um, several types of cotton. So we'll start with some of their sliver and how to um, spin cotton. And then we'll move on to other things like um, handmade Rolex or um, uh, sliver that's been dyed. This is a recycled cotton denim lint that we'll play with. Um, we'll try a commercial cotton puny, which is um, a contradiction. We always want nice, fluffy, loose fibers to spin. And a puny is tightly, tightly compressed, but it spins marvelously. It's a contradiction that's so much fun. Uh, we'll try camel down, uh, sari silk, and we have on the top sari silk fluff, and then below it silk noil. Both of those are short. Gin cotton, which um, is just been taken off the seeds and needs more processing. And here you see gin cotton and a handmade puni. I uh, found some tensel that was short that we'll learn how to spin. I have some polyester that we can spin. And hey, Betty. Um, Betty? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you doing share screen? Yes, it's not sharing. No, I'm sorry. It just dawned on me because when you said we see here, I don't all we see is you. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Let's try again. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, things just aren't cooperating. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I did what happened when share. you clicked on share screen? I hit share screen. And then what happened? And then it tells me to share and. Uh, uh -huh. No, I'm not getting it up. Okay, you want to so just sorry. keep going? Do you have things yeah. you can hold up? No, not nothing's near me because I planned on my sharing the screen. I did practice this and I got it to show, but evidently only you know for how me. It, is. it only works when you don't want it to. Yeah, actually on my computer, it's working beautifully, but that's <laughs> not any help. So, um, well, I'll just go and what you need is um, a spinning wheel. You need to know how to spin a yarn. Don't worry about spinning short fibers. You just need to know how to spin a yarn. You do need a spinning wheel of some type that's not bulk, um, preferably um, a spinning wheel. But if you can't bring a spinning wheel, a spindle is fine. We can work with spindles. Um, we're going to... Um, even get into dog hair. And uh, I'm just disappointed that my sharing isn't working. <laughs> Us too. Um, I think it's great though that you're doing this class because I remember when I took my spinning class, I basically was told, you know, only the best can ever do cotton, that it's so hard, it's so impossible. So this is great that yeah. you're gonna kind of get rid of that myth. Yeah, spinning cotton isn't that hard. There, there's three things you need to do. One, you have to have patience. One, you have to have a loose tension on your wheel. And two, lots of twist. Yeah. Now, if somebody has taken like a, a workshop on how to spin, is that enough experience to take your class or do they need a little more? Oh, that would be enough. Okay. All right. Well, Betty, I'm sorry, but I enjoyed listening to you. I was getting a lot out of it. So thank you all so much, uh, Betty, for being here. Again, it's uh, Spinning Short Fibers. If you're all interested in doing cotton, we're in the South. 
uh, this is your class. It's a one day workshop and it will be Sunday, July the 17th from nine to 4.30. If you have more questions, you can always contact Betty and that information is on our website. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. Next, we have Diane Totten, and she's gonna talk about crimp cloth in depth. It's a one day workshop and it's Monday, July the 19th. Hey, Diane. Hello, hello. Thanks for letting me come and talk about my passion, which is crimp cloth since I started playing with it some 15 years ago and um, thought, okay, it'll last about, oh, maybe a year at the most with my attention span on it. And I am still going strong with it and um, have more ideas now what to do with it, I think, than I had, you know, back when I first started. So uh, I would love to share this with everyone. And what's nice about this one day uh, session is that you don't have to bring a loom for it. Um, and I will include, and I'm going to share my screen right now. Uh, I want that one, I think. Um, yes, okay. So let's see, did it come up? Can you see? Okay, this is a scarf. And what I'm going to go over in the um, seminar, and this is good for all really all levels of, um, of weavers uh, from the beginning, it, sort of an advanced beginner, because you will get more out of it if you can understand how to read a draft and kind of move things around a little bit, which I will go over. It's pretty simple. Um, the crimp cloth is really made up of two elements, um, the ground cloth and then the pull pattern. And they're really simple. Uh, elements that are put together to look complicated. So uh, we start out in another thing, I, I really encourage using your stash. You know, we, we spend the first 50 years gathering and the second 50 getting rid of. So here's a great way to use your stash and get rid of uh, some things is it's fun just putting things together. And I will go over that of, of, you know, just my ideas of getting into your stash and what to do and how you can put things together that you may not have thought of doing before. So anyway, here is um, with it on the loom. This is a four shaft. It happens to be an overshot threading, not treadled as overshot, but an overshot threading. And I show you how to use the different threadings. Any threading will work. Some of course are better than others for a lot more possibilities, but um, any threading will work. And then you can see the scarf, which is a, the, the finished product from, and the color's a little bit off just because the lighting was, was different. Um, and one thing neat about uh, scarves is they can really turn into a shawl. I, there are times I'm on the airplane and I've got my scarf on, but then my shoulders get cold. I just stretch it out. It'll stretch out down to my elbows. And then when I'm warm again, I just let it spring back to being my scarf. So anyway, these are just different um, threadings. That's overshot. Here, here's some samples that are from uh, an eight shaft summer and winter. Uh, this is a combination of a, a twill and advancing twill, the sample there on the side. Um, those three were, were weft crimp. Uh, here's a warp crimp piece. And it's just fun to see what, what's going to happen with it. And I will share lots of uh, examples of it. Another bonus, what we're going to do, I bring part of the supply fee uh, will be, first of all, you get a, a handout, but then um, I weave samples for everyone. So everyone gets a warp sample and a weft sample, and we're going to actually pull those and process them in class so that you can see what happens, what the flat cloth looks like and what, what's going to happen. And, and then get how I tie it off and, and just how you do the whole process. So another thing about crimp cloth is... Um, Oh, here's another thing I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover edge finishes, and I don't do hems. If you look at uh, like the edge on the red piece, um, that's just a cut edge. I've worn that piece a, a lot, and it um, my edge finishes don't um, fray out. Okay. Also, we'll I'll talk some about sewing with crimp cloth. If you look at the red vest there, that's only three seams. It's very simple. What's nice about the garments is um, they fit themselves. So if you're 
if you sell your work, uh, you don't have to worry about sizing here because uh, kind of one size fits most everyone. And um, they, they uh, travel well too. Now these are all uh, weft crimp pieces and these are warp crimp pieces. Um, but I will talk about the sewing too. Another nice thing is how well they travel. Now, this is the way they live. Um, they've been living in the suitcase for two years now because they haven't gone anywhere to take them out. But the top I have on, I just, I, I roll them up. I just pulled it out and, and put it on it. it uh, it's wonderful. So we're gonna go over everything from start to finish. And um, if you want more, just an, another little plug, if you want more than just listening about all this, I'm doing a three-day workshop starting the day after this seminar. So then you can really get hands-on more than just uh, pulling the fabric. And yes. here's my email address if you want um, more information about uh, either the one-day seminar or the three-day workshop. I was thinking about that when you were talking, uh, Diane. I thought how great it would be to take the one-day workshop and then go into your three-day um, it would well, put you at an advantage, wouldn't it? Absolutely, it would. That's a great idea. I didn't think, it, okay, I'm plugging both. <laughs> Take one and then right into the other. And like I say, I don't know if I finished my sentence on it's good from uh, for beginners to the uh, seasoned advanced weaver, because it's not about a weave structure. It's about what you do with whatever weave structure you have. I even had one student come. She said, I didn't have time to thread a loom. And she said, I just brought what I had on it. We made it work. She had a great sample. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's any, any weave structure will work. Great stash buster. Um, well, since we're doing plugging, I'm going to plug that Diane will be on Textiles and Tea next week if you want to learn more about her and her weaving and her teaching. So... There's another plug next Tuesday, Diane, be there. <laughs> and I'll have my tea. I'll have my tea. Are you have, she'll have her tea. Yeah. Uh, thank yeah. you, Diane. Again, Diane Totten, Crimp Cloth in Depth. It's a one-day workshop. It's Monday, July the 19th. Thanks, Diane. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we've got Janie Taylor, Totally Tied Weaves. It's a 90-minute seminar. It's Saturday, July the 16th. Hey, Janie. I, I am, my video hasn't started yet, but I'm here and um, <laughs> I, can I, can I do it myself here? You cannot, the host has asked you to start your video. There we go. Thank you. All right. Well, here I am. There she is. I have a little floating window that I need to get rid of. Hold on. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you for scheduling me right between two of my favorite weavers, Diane Totten and, and uh, Robin Spady. So this is a, this is this is a prime prime location here. So thank you. Um, I'm here to talk about my talk, which is about um, tide weaves. So um, this it is a 90 minute seminar, and the purpose of this is to try to establish a a foundation for people in not their knowledge of tide weaves, and so. Um, if, if you want to know more, if you already know everything about tide weaves, maybe this isn't the class for you, but if you want to learn more about tide weaves and have a real grounding in what that means, this is the class for you. So I, I start getting serious about tide weaves about 10 years ago or so. I took a, I enrolled in the uh, complex weaver study group on tide weaves, and that was, that was a really good thing to do. I learned a lot and, and a study group where you have people that are like-minded and have the like interest and you can bounce ideas off each other it really was it really was very valuable i think i'd recommend that to people if you want to if you want to learn more about a topic it's a good place to do it anyway i i took it was a year-long study and i had a i had a wonderful time and i learned an, an incredible amount about tide weaves the other thing that i learned is as i was taking this um, class and i talked to fellow weavers and I'd say, well, I'm working on tide weaves. And I, there were a lot of them that went, oh, that's good. What is that? <laughs> what is a tide weave? Um, so, you know, they may know a little bit about summer and winter, and they may or may not know even that that's a tide weave. And so, you know, it. what I realized at that point is, is that this is something that we need more knowledge about out in the world of weaving. So uh, having a 90-minute talk uh, about this, 
that we that I could um, help people understand this better. So that was the idea, and hopefully that hopefully that's what will happen. Anyway, this talk is divided into three segments, and the first one is just where does tide weave fit into the whole hierarchy of weaving? What you know, where is it? What is it? So you know, first we look at it, and we just look at this big the big umbrella the big umbrella of weaving, of course, and then. then underneath there's another umbrella that's block weaves so it it is it, it's in that umbrella it's a block weave so then we say well okay well there are lots of block weaves and not all block weaves are tied weaves so so what else is it so not only is it a block weave it's a unit weave and in, in that I can take a little threading or treadling module and just repeat it and do whatever I want with it. I can have my way with these old modules and do whatever I want in, in the sense of designing. So that, so, okay, it's a block weave, it's a unit weave, but again, not all unit weaves are tied unit weaves. So we have another little subset underneath and another little umbrella, and those are the tied weaves. So these are the tied unit weaves. They're they're tied weaves, they're unit weaves, and they're block weaves. So they're all three of those things, but they're a specialized version of a block weave. So we spend some time talking about, go oh, ahead, what it is, just sort of defining what it is and putting it in place in the in the whole continuum of weaving. So the second session is more nuts and bolts about how do you actually construct a tied weave draft? How you know what's going on with the threading? How do you need what do you need to do to make a tied weave threading? And then, since the threading is just a threading, I mean, a tied weave threading that wasn't woven as tied weave isn't a tight weave, it's just a threading. So how do you then take that tied weave threading and what do you need to do to treadle it to make a tied weave fabric? So we spend quite a bit of time looking at how it works and how to actually, um, I, I use a lot of, I am a proselytizer for weaving software because this makes this makes designing weaving so much easier um, that you know, we'll talk about how you might be able to use your software to help you build a tied weave draft and how it works. So we'll spend quite a bit of time on that. And then the, the third session, the third section of the talk is sort of a survey of well, eight or five, I don't know, several, <laughs> several tied weaves. Certainly not every tied weave, but a lot of the sort of known tied weaves, Bergman, tied overshot, you know, summer and winter. We're, we'll talk about what what they are, what makes them different from the rest. They're, they're still all tied weaves, they're still under that same umbrella, but what makes one different from the other? What makes how many how many th threads are in a in a threading unit in a unit? You know, is this is this summer and winter with a four end unit or is this Bergman with a 16 end unit? I mean, what is it? And what's the ratio of tie downs to pattern? And so we'll talk about all those kind of technical details on each one of these weaves and we can see you know why you might choose one over the other. And what I want to kind of show you a little hi, Kathy. Yeah. Oh, oh, I just you just jumped onto the screen for a minute. So you jumped onto my screen. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I just I want to show you some of, some of the little differences. This, these oh, these poor guys are upside down. Sorry, um, these are some uh, dragonflies on a double two tie unit weave, which actually has a two end. Uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm gonna let them be upside down. They look better. So this is a two end half block, and in this case, we can use block half block at a time. So we can get some very small detailed kinds of images with this. And then if I go on to something more like this happens to be the same image, the exact same image, the exact same profile um, as uh, this is tied overshot. This is uh, even tied overshot and so the threading units here and the the whole units are four ends so you have four ends in the threading and four ends in the treadling to make these images so it's twice as big because the blocks are twice as big so that makes perfect sense so if you want a hey, larger image hey Janie want, I just yes? I, we're going to have to wrap up but I wanted to say that I was talking with somebody about your class and they said well, I don't know anything about tide weaves. And I was thinking, that's why you take the class, you know? So I encourage people, if 
listening to you, they're going, but I don't understand what that means. That's what the class is about. And I think you'll get a lot out of it when you get Tide Weaves explained, you know, in your wonderful seminar that you're going to do. So Thank again, that's, I encourage exactly, That's exactly it. If, if you don't know about Tide Weaves, this is the one to take. So yes, exactly. Thanks. It's one of those terms that buzzes around your head as a weaver, but you're not really sure what it means. Janie will give you the answer. Thank you so much, Janie. Janie Taylor is teaching this class, Totally Tide Weaves. It is Saturday, the July the 16th. It's from 1.30 to 3. Again, more information is available um, on our website about the class and how to sign up. Thanks, Janie. Next up, Robin Spady, The Beauty of Lace Weaves. Oh, this is so pretty. This is a two-day workshop. It's Tuesday through Wednesday, July the 19th through the 20th. Hey, Robin. Hello. Um, thank you for having me. I always love the opportunity to talk about weaving, especially one of my favorite topics, which is lace weaves. So I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to go over to my PowerPoint and let that come up. Um, and I guess I get to say what we're doing today is a preview of coming attractions. So coming soon to Convergence, I'm doing a two day workshop, the numbers T139, The Beauty of Lace Weeks. This is a Robin Spady production. And I'm so excited about doing this because I probably uh, will have nothing but lace weaves for a couple of decades because they were so great. Um, they're beautiful there and there's more that you can do with them than a lot of people realize this workshop has been rated G and this is G for general weavers so you don't have to have a lot of experience in weaving to come and participate you need to be able to just warp a loom then you're going to get instructions ahead of time there are threadings for four six and eight shaft looms and so you get to pick uh, the threading of your choice and best of all it's horror free. You do not have to trade looms with anybody or move around. You're going to pre warp your loom and you will weave only on your loom during this workshop at the pace you feel most comfortable at. Now, Brad Pitt, George Clooney, I'm sorry, they won't be there. But we're going to see a lot of other really wonderful things that are just as beautiful as these two men. We're going to have starry Atwater Bronson lace. Um, this is a very classic, well-known weave, but we're also going to see these weaves in color. We're going to take things into new dimensions and say, well, why does a lace weave have to be one color or um, why can't it be more? Also starring is the ever popular Huck lace. Woohoo! I'm so excited about this. Probably my favorite weave of all time. It is beautiful, it is fun. Um, and not only can you do it in one color, but you can also do it in more colors. So we're gonna explore that. And then the, the another headliner is Swedish Lace. Um, now Swedish Lace, um, we're going to discuss what is the difference between Atwater Bronson Huck and Swedish. These are the three moon controlled lace weaves. What are the advantages to disadvantages? What are the very clear distinctions between them? Now, Swedish lace, again, doesn't have to just be in one color. It can be in multiple colors. So I'll be able to show you Swedish lace sort of incognito. It's a disguise. It doesn't quite look like a traditional Swedish lace, but there's reasons that you can use Swedish lace in a number of different ways, including what? Color and even more color. There's one just on one threading. You can do a whole bunch of different things. And these cast members are not going to be performing just by themselves. I'm also going to have a lace weave duet. So we're going to combine Huck and Swedish lace together in two of the threadings, a four shaft and a six shaft. And you're going to see how complementary these two weaves are and how much fun it is to combine these two lace weaves together into a single cloth. But wait, there's more. There's got to be more. There's That's just not it. That's loom controlled lace weaves. I'm also going to share with you uh, weaver controlled lace weaves such as Lino, Danish medallion, Spanish lace, and we're even going to have a special appearance by Bead Lino. Uh, it's going to be two days of lace weaves, of color, of all sorts of things to really knock it up into sort of a, 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 a new stratosphere um, from what a lot of people know that are possible with lace weaves. 
So coming this July at Convergence, the beauty of lace weaves. And in case you don't know it, registration is open. So come on over and sign up. Thanks. Robin, you slay me. Now, if you all think this was entertaining, wait till you take her class because I have taken her class and Robin not only teaches well, she'll keep you entertained. So thank you so much for this. This was wonderful. Um, thank you. I'm a lover of lace weave also, and I'm just, I would love to get in there and get my hands on all those beautiful lace weaves. So Robin Spady, as always, the beauty of lace weaves. It's a two day workshop, Tuesday through Wednesday. If you want more information, go to the website and you can see um, everything you need to sign up. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. Uh, next up, Susan Lazier, uh, three hour seminar, Monday, July 19th, prototyping garments. Hi, Susan. Now I need. There you are. Now I need face and audio. Okay. There you are. Okay, here I am. Uh, I'm going to share screen in just a moment, but I wanted to say hi. Uh, so this is prototyping. And the first thing I want people to think about is to lay down their fears of, <laughs> I can't do this. I don't know what to do. You just have to kind of go back to playing paper dolls because that's what it amounts to in many ways. And so I'm going to share my screen and then I'm going to be flipping between a little bit of PowerPoint, but um, hopefully, can you see my table? Just somebody confirm. Yes, yeah. I can see okay. it. All right, so we're going to be prototyping clothing and there's many different approaches and I'm going to show you several, but why would you want to do this? And the main reason is uh, you can create unique patterns and they can be very, very simple. They can be made from rectangular pieces that you're just putting together in different ways. You can work out a concept. You can test the drape of a given fabric. Um, you can prep in small so that if you actually want to take it all the way to a prototype sewing, you know, it's not a whole lot of energy to work that out. So basically, that's the, one of many reasons why we do this, or many reasons, actually. Um, I'm going to be bringing these dolls, one for everyone to work with in class. They are a quarter scale, size 10. And we'll some of the class will be working on these and you will bring your fabric and basically just be fearless about cutting it up into pieces and trying things uh and you you know you might say but i'm not a size 10 and that's okay too because partly what we're going to do in class as well is uh measure get show you which body measurements you need so that you can translate what you've done on here to whatever size you want or whatever person you want. Everybody has a shoulder width, everybody has elbow length, you know, so to get to the elbow. So I'll also explain the translation process, like how do you get this to a full scale pattern? Uh, and, you know, you'll be putting things together. Uh, so I'm going to go through a few examples. So this garment, I was just working with uh, a knit that could represent any kind of fabric that has this hand and drape. And so it doesn't matter whether you're using hand woven or knits or mixing your media or commercial fabrics mixed with whatever, it, it's the process that will get you places. So these were just two examples of See what you can do by just pretty much working with rectangles and then working out a concept, pinning it together. You can baste it together. I'll go show you a couple others that went further. Um, this was just, I didn't do the full length because I didn't need to, but I was experimenting with, I know you can take a rectangle and build a cape, but I want a little more drape to it. So there's a bit of a technique to that. And so what I did, let me just slide this off. If, you know, in the doing of it, you're trying to decide how much above the shoulders, which will become collar, and how much below, which becomes straight. But you'll see that I angled my armholes. And so when it's worn, you are forcing some drape in here. So this actually, and I'll probably show you this full scale at the end, became this cape here, which I'm too close in for you to really get an idea. And so if this was hand woven, fine, you're just gonna put a binding. This happens to be a piece of Nuno felt garment. 
or fabric that I had purchased at a trade show. And so with that, I could get a pretty good idea of how that was going to work and build the cake. But I'll, I'll show you this one on me because it's you're, we're too close right now. So that is uh, one example. Um, another example is this black one. <laughs> I just want, I love what I call transformer clothes, one garment that can be worn in multiple ways. And so I started, if you can kind of see here with just a rectangle and I'm just working in a knit for prototyping and cut a bunch of slits into it. And then it became like, so how many different looks can I get with this? You know, so by having these slits, which could be finished, you know, you can start seeing the things that you could do in the wearing of the garment to create a different look. You can put the head through the armhole and get another look. You can put it back to front and get another look. So this is part of my Transformers series. And I'll just flip into PowerPoint because I have um, a picture. This is the garment that um, resulted from this. And so you can see three different ways that it can be worn. So this one here just happens to be machine knit in this case. All you need is the ability to make a slit and to bind the edges if you're cutting woven fabric. But so that's kind of pushing the edge in a different direction. Uh, another way that I do this is, um, you know, I might see a picture in a magazine and so, there, there was a picture in Artful Home that I really liked. And so I was kind of work trying to work out how do they do that pattern? And so sometimes I just take fabric up to my quarter scale and or I create a quarter scale pattern um, and started playing with it. And I can tell you when I got this done, I realized this is not where this needs to go. And so what this became, and again, I'll show you this full scale once I get off the table it became this top here. And you can see that some changes happened, but again, this, you need to see this full scale. So I'll show this to you in just a few moments. So that's another approach. Um, then sometimes I am actually almost creating patterns. Yeah, and so this is a quarter scale pattern where I was testing scale of sleeves and pockets. And so even though I had my base, I could then see what size pocket works. So that's yet another approach. And yeah, again, sometimes I've got, I wanna mix fabrications. And so in getting my fabric down to a manageable scale, I can actually color up the pattern to see how it's all going to look in proportion. And I've got some pictures on that too. Um, I'm gonna jump before I get off of the table here. You can move from quarter scale to half scale. Hey, hey, Susan. Yeah. I hate to tell you this, but your time's up. Oh, okay. I know. It's hard to believe. Well, but you that know, fast. I thought I didn't even have enough. All right. All right. Anyway, so one, one thing I think is great about this is that here's a message to all you watching. Every weaver I've ever known has said the same thing. I really would like to make clothes out of my hand woven. I just don't know where to start. This looks like it would be an excellent place to start. So all of you who are thinking about that, you might want to take a look at this class. This might be a great way to take that first step toward cutting, oh my gosh, cutting your hand woven. And I think Susan will hold your hand while you do it. But this looks like a great way to get started. Wow. It's prototyping garments. It's a three-hour seminar. It's Susan Lazier, Monday, July 19. Thank you, Susan. Sorry to cut you off. Oh, no worries. No if you want more information, you can go to Susan's website or you can go to our website and learn more about this great class. Thanks, Susan. Okay. Uh, again, want to register? Go to wespendie.org slash sessions. Uh, the write-ups about the sessions are on that page. You can also uh, sign up for your class and learn more about the following um, classes. Hotels. The there's more information online, the Marriott downtown, the Crown Plaza, the Hyatt, the Cumberland House. Um, they're all great hotels that you might wanna choose to uh, um, get your reservation. But again, just remind you, don't call them and get your reservation, go through the link online. Um, if you call them straight, you may not get the um, convergence rate and we want you to do that. 
Again, please join us this summer, July 15th through the 21st. It'll be in Knoxville, Tennessee. We are excited and we hope we will see you there. We have more classes tomorrow and Friday, Thursday, yeah, tomorrow and Friday. If you wanna learn more about um, more teachers, we'll be on then too. Thank you so much.